Good morning, everyone, and we welcome you to our Saturday morning, April 8, 2017, Bible study. We are recording from Plainfield, New Jersey, United States of America, Plainfield Christian Science Church Independent. And today, our moderator is Luann from New York. Go ahead, Luann. Good morning, everyone. Our opening statement is from Miscellaneous Writings by Mary Baker Eddy. <clears throat> then you meekly bow before the Christ, the spiritual idea that our great master gave of the power of God to heal and to save. Then it is that you behold for the first time the divine principle that redeems man from under the curse of materialism, sin, disease, and death. Thank you. Thank you. Topic for today is Thou Art Mine. First question, what does the word redeem mean? Save. Restore. To recover, to rescue, to save, sometimes with compensation. To rescue from captivity or bondage or any obligation or liability to suffer. I found that it, it means um, a little bit more than that, like a, a stronger sense of it. Um, restore back into the possession of its rightful owner. Reconcile yes. to God through the Christ. I think it always means that something has fallen away or gone away from their prior or their primary estate. Yeah, so it's to recover, <clears throat> recover what is essentially yours. Who is the Redeemer? The one that loves, the one that cares enough to want to get back what was lost or seems lost. You know, the one that owns everything in the first place <laughs> and knows where it belongs. Is so God our Redeemer? Yes, God is our God Redeemer. Is God is our Redeemer. That beautiful, beautiful music from the Messiah, I know that my Redeemer liveth. We should all feel that. We should all know that. That we have a Redeemer, someone who is going to save us, recover, help us, restore. And we should feel that he liveth. I'm going to read, because I was looking up what Mrs. Eddy says about redeem and redeemer, and I think the most beautiful thing that she said um, in retrospection and introspection, page 23, Emergence into Light. The trend of human life was too eventful to leave me undisturbed in the illusion that this so-called life could be a real and abiding rest. All things earthly must ultimately yield to the irony of fate or else be merged into the one infinite love. As these pungent lessons became clearer, they grew sterner. Previously, the cloud of mortal mind seemed to have a silver lining, but now it was not even fringed with light. Matter was no longer spanned with its rainbow of promise. The world was dark. The oncoming hours were indicated by no floral dial. The senses could not prophesy sunrise or starlight. Thus it was when the moment arrived of the hearts bridled to more spiritual existence, when the door opened, I was waiting and watching, and lo, 
the bridegroom came. The character of the Christ was illuminated by the midnight torches of spirit. My heart knew its Redeemer. He whom my affections had diligently sought was as the one altogether lovely, as the chiefest, the only among ten thousand. Soulless famine had fled. Agnosticism, pantheism, and theosophy were void. Being was beautiful. Its substance, cause, and current were God and his idea. I had touched the hem of Christian science. That whole chapter is one page, Emergence into Light. All of us need to feel what she felt, that our Redeemer liveth, that he's with us, that we see him, and that when the pains and sorrow of this Adam dream, this human sense of living, offer no rainbow hope, that is when this Redeemer comes and saves us and brings us into the true sense of being Christian science. It's absolutely beautiful. Okay. Um, should we go on question number two? <clears throat> What was happening in Judah prior well, to... Well, before we do that, can I, I, we already talked about but I really thought the sense of recover, regain possession, really um, meaningful in terms of understanding the word redeem. You know, because um, it means there's no separation. You know, we're, we're a part of God. You know, the sense of, um, you know, um, regaining possession. That's all. Yeah, I mean, scientifically, what's happening? What is really going on? What what is what is Mrs. Eddy experience that Mary just read? To me, it was there is no life, truth, intelligence, nor substance in matter. Yeah, the mortal picture, the mortal belief that is appears to us is bondage. It's not the truth. There's no freedom in it. There's no liberty in it. There's no hope in it. It might appear to have some glimmer of hope to it. This is Eddie came to the realization that there's no hope at all. When we get to the point where we realize that this mortal dream has nothing, zero, worth pursuing, then we are ready to accept the Christ truth, and only then. And the redemption process is our eyes being open to the truth. I like what Tom said. In reality, there's no separation. It's not like God is coming from somewhere and grabbing us and saying, okay, you know, move over here. Huh. And I think it awakens us to what we are, what we've always been and will always be. I think of the, the hymn 253 when it talks about the Christ comes, divinely talk is the ever presence of the Christ with us all the time. And when we've fallen away or feel like we are separated, here it is to come, to comfort us, to make us know that, no, I'm here with you. Yes. That's beautiful. Yeah. When you, when you can spiritualize your thought, then you start to understand more, you, and you get more understanding of, of God and, and uh, 
the world around you. I, I know that when, when I saw like all those pine trees and everything were cut down and then my, my, my thought it changed after that, that I kind of got humble that God is in control. My humility was, you know, lifted up and then I could see them for what they were. When I went back through, there, there were more trees there. So once you begin to learn to spiritualize your thought, then you start to see what's really there. Yes. Nothing is lost. All is gained. The only thing that's lost is the incorrect sense of things, the belief. Once I got, well, then, then my true, the true vision of it was restored. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's just, this is not something where God finally swoops down and pulls us out of something. <laughs> so this is us finally losing faith in that which is never served to have faith in it in the first place. have a rainbow hanging over it at all. No, it never did. Yeah, I really like that. Yeah. Not even fringe with light. Because I, I would think of the dark, impenetrable cloud of hair that, that they talked about upon a purpose. Whenever I look back, I, that's all I see. So <laughs> I don't want to go back to that. That's, for sure. that's right. And Pond and Purpose describes all of this so beautifully. As does the new birth. Mrs. Betty speaks of it often because she experienced it, and that's why her words have such beauty and such meaning and such power. But only to those who can feel it and see it themselves. There was a time I read all of this, and it meant nothing to me because I wasn't working in the truth at that time. So, Chamberlain? Um. What was happening in Judah prior to Isaiah's prophecy? Well, there was a lot of turmoil, and there was, and if and Israel and Syria would join together to resist Assyria. Assyria was on the move, trying to expand its empire. And Judah did not join the others. Uh, because Isaiah encouraged them to trust only in, in the Lord. What happened when Hezekiah was there? Well, he, he, he heeded Isaiah, and God rewarded his faith by destroying the Assyrian host that was coming at them. But in a moment of weakness, he showed the ambassadors from Babylon the house of, his, of his, all of his treasures. And that was when it, it, uh, Isaiah you know, prophesied that there would be trouble with Babylon. First it was going to be Assyria, but then it was going to be Babylon. But he always eventually spoke of the pardon and deliverance and restoration. Thank you. <clears throat> so there was a lot of wealth, a lot of materialism, great stupidity. Idol worship. Yes. That people lived in luxury and idleness. Government was corrupt. It oppressed the poor. Not everyone lived in luxury. The poor were very poor. And the prophets failed to do the job God had given them to do. Which was what? And what were they doing? Not a day of truth. So 
what were the prophets telling them? That everything was okay. Yeah. They were telling them what they wanted to hear. They were not waking them up. They were spineless wonders. Isaiah did foretell that they would be taken away to Babylon. Yes, Isaiah was not among the, those prophets. Oh. Isaiah spoke the truth, as did who were his, some of his contemporaries. Um, he had a few contemporaries. And Isaiah's time. Micah. Micah. Was Jeremiah a little after? Yes, he was. Yeah. Isaiah, in his forewarnings, you know, the, the book of Isaiah, going from chapters 1 through 39, there's a lot of rebukes, and warnings, and everything. And the comfort part of Isaiah starts chapter 40 and going forward from there. But it actually told in the history of Isaiah went three years without clothes and without shoes to warn the people what's coming if you continue in the ways that you're doing now. It will be desolation. So he made quite a graphic so I'd say example of forewarning. Think of it. Here was a society that was very relatively very prosperous. They had become complacent begun to worship other idols. And, and the, the, the devil was surrounding them, coming after them. Hosea of course, was also one of the prophets at that time. Was they, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I was looking at the timeline. He was only about 20 years before. He warned them. Isaiah warned them. How many people listened? Man, not very many. So this doesn't sound familiar today, does it? No, well, I think the prophets were acting like maybe politicians today, or uh, people that are just single-minded uh, in their interests. Yes, just single-minded in their interest, selfishness or greed. Yeah, Hezekiah had a, had a rude awakening, didn't he? I'm thinking that the first 40 chapters of this of Isaiah was paints a horrible picture of the the world, and it, it's kind of you know like what's going on in in Syria and and all that today. And, uh, and afterwards, he tells of God's redemption and restoration and all that stuff. But the first 40 chapters kind of reminded me of what's, what's happening today. Absolutely. With all that stuff in the Middle East. It's a horrible it's, picture. A lot of writers talk about, he, he was talking about the disregard for God's law and the covenant, and that they were rebellious, deceitful, and unwilling to listen to the Lord's instruction. So they had to repent. Yeah, and this is not, we're not talking about Syria here. We're talking about the United States of America today. We're talking about Europe. We're talking about so called civilized countries. Judah was the most civilized country in the world at the time that, you know, that we're aware of. That's the danger of materiality. The curse of materialism, as Mrs. Eddy describes it in miscellaneous writings that Luann just read. Yes. One of the things I really uh, love that I found here was that in Isaiah 6, 9, after I, it says um, Uzziah died, um, he saw the Lord upon a throne. Uh, Isaiah did. And this is where Isaiah was there. And he heard a voice, the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who shall go for us? Then I said, and that was Isaiah, Here I am, send me. And God said, Go and tell this people. Um, but he also 
told him that they were not going to hear or, or see what he had to say. But he was sent. I, n I never picked that up in all this time. I never disrespected Isaiah. I just never thought about it. So all these lessons that we've been having the last few weeks really congealed to me and how important Isaiah is because he has Isaiah 53 and 54 that speaks of Mrs. Eddie and Jesus and prophesies. And all the stuff he went through in the first 40 books, or 1 through 39, all the stuff he went through and all the work he did, it was to me reminded me of uh, Jesus and Mrs. Eddie and all these people who tried to help and speak and, and warn the people and they didn't listen, but they also got visions that they shared with the world or what uh, was going to come in, in God's grace and goodness. That was 740 BC. Wow. I read the uh, preface in Matthew and Henry to the book of Isaiah, and uh, as Gary had pointed out, very much a couple of things that what we're going through the whole world, I mean, this country. And... Uh, a couple of things that stuck with me out of that was that uh, said that the worship was very mere materialistic, and uh, many that will readily part with their sacrifices. In other words, they would willingly take one of their animals and sacrifice it, but they refused to part with their sins. And uh, also the backsliding of those that have professed religion and the uh, relation to God are in a special manner provoking to him. In other words, the ones that uh, pretended to worship and worship very materially were more irritating to God as uh, they were saying false things in his name. Thank you. That's interesting. It was easier for them to sacrifice an animal than it was for them to repent of their ways. Well, don't we see that in certain so-called religious organizations today? Buy off your buy off your sin. Give enough money to the cardinal. <laughs> Found a, a paragraph in. Uh, Martha Wilcox's book, um, Spiritual Understanding of the Scriptures, that speaks to why this Christ idea was not retained by uh, the patriarchs and, and prophets. I can read this. Yes. One often wonders why it was that the Christian era did not appear at the time of the patriarchs and prophets with men of such high vision and power with God. The reason is that Christ actually was appearing in his maturity to these men of old. But these patriarchs and prophets had an exalted view which could not be retained by the less spiritually minded, a view that was beyond the human comprehension of mortals. The general thought of that time was that was not prepared to receive the Christ. Students prepared thought is the doorway through which revelation comes. Truth is withheld from those who cannot comprehend it. It remains for Isaiah to perceive that in order for Christ or truth to be retained, this coming of the Christ or this immaculate conception must take place within the consciousness of each individual. Thank you. That's exactly right. Great, though. Yeah. Yes. So this is how it is done, because otherwise, you know, it seemed despairing. It's individual. We have to handle it in our own consciousness, what we see, what we accept to be true and real. And as our thought ascends, what does the Bible say? If I be lifted up, I will lift all, I will all men unto me. I will draw all men unto me. So you do it individually, but it is a great, a great benefit for all when you do it. That's part of our watch, too, when we do that. It I is. Learned that here. Yes. And you know, when you are doing these watches, you are keeping up 
um, because otherwise it, you can get overwhelmed with what you see in the, in the news and you just feel it's so discouraging. But as we do our watches and as you do your daily watch and the unity watch, you are keeping your slate clear. You're keeping it in the realm of the unreal, um, which it must be because it is always the Adam dream. Whatever we're handling, it's an aggressive mental suggestion. And if you don't, then you suffer the consequences and you can feel depressed or whatever else because you think it is real, it seems very real. So this is why <clears throat> the watching is so hugely important. And I feel it is. God says I will overturn, 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 and that's what's happening. It's overturning, and any arrow that's been hidden or trying to hide is coming out to be exposed and destroyed. So that's the wonderful thing about Isaiah. It has such beautiful passages in which he uplifts uh, thought and promises um, blessings. So right. So it's beautiful. It's and that's because he knew he knew his Redeemer liveth. He knew what God is, is what we'll get into in one of the next questions. So did we cover that question too? Tom, did you want to say anything? Tom. Um. Are we ready for number three? Sure. What was the purpose of Isaiah's writings? Word. <laughs> Didn't know what to put there. Wake people up. Yes. interesting. I read one of the definitions of prophet is to boil up like a fountain. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, and Isaiah 30, 8 and 9, it said, he was told, Isaiah said, go and write it before them on a tablet and inscribe it in a book so that it may be for the time to come as a witness forever. Interesting to boil up like a fountain. Uh, Reverend Kratzer said in Revelation interpreted about inspiration that it, it, when it comes in, you, you have to write it. You can't just sit on it. Thank you. Yes, right. I think I also get the sense of shaking up, shaking up everything. Well, there, there is a lot of prophecy in Isaiah. Um, and there are different ways of looking at that. I know a lot of people look at it as a way to say that uh, Isaiah did not write Isaiah because it was impossible to know what would happen in the future, you know. So it must have been someone else in the very human book. But another way to look at it is that uh, Isaiah was a prophet, you know. Um, and so... Um, this is, you know, um, uh, these are truths that are coming from God through Isaiah, you know, for us to learn. Anyway, I think it's kind of an interesting point because um, I know a lot of Christian scientists um, believe that uh, Isaiah didn't write Isaiah. They turn, turn uh, the book into a very human, uh, human type of writing, you know? Right. Which so takes away Christian from scientists, uh, Christian scientists in name only. Uh, yeah. No, Isaiah Isaiah was the light of the world at the time. He he wrote what God gave him to write. It was a lot of warning. I mean, out of the love for God's children, God was warning them. And Isaiah was the one who was willing to listen gave up a lot to do that. He could have probably lived a very comfortable life, but instead he had to deal with a lot of people very unhappy with him. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you see, the human mind always wants to humanize, to get back to what Tom was saying. They, 
they can't believe that someone could know so much in, in, in advance. So they humanize it. That, that, that just shows where they're coming from. So his prophecy, what, and what were the prophecies? The, the promise of the Christ. Yes. Yeah. What was important. the other? He also prophesied of their um, servant and that they were going to be taken over. Right. But there were two major prophecies in Isaiah. We talked about it a few weeks ago, and Linda mentioned it a few minutes ago. Isaiah 53 is the prophecy of Christ Jesus. And Isaiah 54 is what? The prophecy of Mary Baker Eddy. The, the woman and the apostle. Yes. Yeah. Now, I'm going to go into this a little bit more today. Some of you know this. But someone want to speak? All right. Some of you know this because I've spoken to you during the week. But a week or so ago, Gary got a call from David Keeson, who's our friend and he's out in Oregon now. He has a, a website, Christian Science Unlimited. Healing and Healing and He took over the Rare Book Company, which is the company we used to deal with to get all our books. They had been located in New Jersey. They folded up and he took all their books. So anyway, Gary got a call from him and he said he had all these boxes of books that he was taking to the dump. And would we like any? So um, Gary mentioned some names to me. Some I didn't know, some I did. But anyway, I asked for the Gilman book, which is Recollections of Mrs. Eddy, and also a book, I'm not sure if his name is pronounced Smiley or Smiley, but I'll call him Smiley, that's happier. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's called Smiley. So those books, are, and um, with only the cost of postage, and the Paul Smiley book, a lot of it is, again, why Mrs. Eddy is considered the woman in the apocalypse. Now, I thought this is a, a strong message from God. You know, during the course of time, so many things come to me from various sources, and I'm always praying that prayer, feed my sheep. Father, give me whatever is needed that you want your children to know and to understand. So, when these things come to me, um, there's a significance to them. Before this, the week before, so I was reading the book by Liz Knapp, The Destiny of the Mother Church, which also emphasizes this point. Now, for many people, to accept Mrs. Eddy as the woman in the apocalypse is perhaps an easy thing. As Carol said, she understood it as a child. But I have heard from some of you, I mean, there was a well-known teacher who had a very large association in California, who taught that she was not, that she was just a generic man, which she did, does say, but as we talked about, she couldn't announce to the world that this is what she was at that time because it would have brought on her the anathema of mortal mind. The anathema of mortal mind. So um, I, I'm going to read you some selections from this book. Now, we have a whole box of them, and anyone who wants this book can have it. I'm not sure I'm going to, we're, we'll put it on our website to sell, but uh, it's, it is available. The other tragic thing to me is, where was this book going? Where was this box of book going? To the dump. dump. To the dump. <clears throat> Meaning, no one cares, no one wants it. Okay. So you listen, and you listen well to this, because it's very important. In the 12 years with Mary Baker Eddy, pages 75 to 76, Mrs. Eddy asked, what is it that made Jesus the Messiah? Tomlinson then recorded her response. I will give you the answer, she replied. The true answer in the language of the Bible, quote, he loved righteousness and hated iniquity, end quote. Then she proceeded to explain 
that the true Christian not only loves the right, but that he hates iniquity and is willing to uncover the evil in himself and in others. She made it clear that he was not a true disciple who closed his eyes to wrongdoing and took no steps to unmask the wrongdoer and bring to an end the evil doing. She further commented that in Christian science, we are not to draw back from our duty of exposing error and thus causing it to be destroyed from fear of adding fuel to error's flame, whether it appears likely to harm us or the cause of truth. We are to do right and leave the consequences to God. Now, she says that part of her demonstration, yes, was her revelation was divine science. She also says in this book, and it's quoting her, that the second part was the uncovering of animal magnetism, wasn't it? To hate iniquity and to destroy iniquity. Now, this lesson never wants to be taught. As you can see, I've been, everything's been trying to take my voice all week. But that doesn't matter. I'm going to teach it anyway or give it to you anyway because it is highly important that you understand this. Now, in the first volume of We Knew Mary Baker Eddy, Mrs. Eddy is quoted as saying, all the people need in order to love and adopt Christian science is a true sense of its founder. In proportion as they have found it, it will advance our cause. She doesn't say healing, does she? She says a proper understanding of her is what will advance the cause. Mrs. Eddy does not say that the acceptance of and love for her cause was contingent upon healing, lecturing, teaching, or writing. She says that all the people need is a true sense of her. Considering the stagnation of the Christian science movement, we obviously have not gotten the true sense of our leader. Something is definitely missing. We have biographies dealing with her life, the cultural climate of her time, chronological and historical accounts of her day, some very scholarly reports of her life. And yet her statement on page 40 of the first volume of We Knew Mary Baker Eddy still holds true and even demands our attention because the people are not adopting Christian science. So, and she says, because of this, we have, or he says, we have the ominous, biblical pronouncement to consider at this late date. Where there is no vision, the people perish. The lack of vision concerning our leader has ominous consequences for us individually, for cause, and for the world. And then, Mrs. Eddy wrote in a letter, she warned, the united plan of the evildoers is to cause the beginners, either in lecturing or teaching or in our periodicals, to keep Mrs. Eddy as she is, well, and then parentheses, what God knows of her and revealed to Christ Jesus, end of parentheses, out of sight, and to keep her as she is not, parentheses, just another white-haired old lady, end of parentheses. She said this herself constantly before the public. Okay, so the plan of evil is to keep what Mrs. Eddy truly is out of sight and to keep her as just a nice, white-haired old lady before the public. And isn't this what has happened? I mean, Tom has spoken of it. Linda has spoken of it. She's just considered a, you know, founder of any religion, nice person. 19th century physician, metaphysical thinker. Yes. And Mrs. Eddy continues. This kills two birds with one stone. It darkens the spiritual sense of students and misguides the public. Why? Because it misstates the idea of the divine principle that you are trying to demonstrate and hides it from the sense of the people. End of her quote. Many who are confident that they have the true sense of our leader are mistaken. Malicious animal magnetism is manipulating, deceiving, and mis misleading the very elect. Because her life is not understood correctly, the movement continues to diminish and foolish decisions affecting the present and future peace and prosperity of our planet are made. 
exhale. Then, one more quote from Mrs. Eddy. In a letter to Edward Kimball in 1893, she wrote, For the world to understand me in my true light in life would do more for our cause than aught else would. This I learned from the fact that the enemy tries harder to hide these two things from the world than to win any other point. Also, Jesus' life and character and their first appearing were treated in like manner. And I regret to see that loyal students are not more awake to this great demand in their measures to meet the enemy's tactics. So, and when you think about it, I mean, I know some of you have looked at her up in Wikipedia, what Wikipedia says about her. Um, what you see, you know, if, if I know people who sometimes find our church and then look on the internet and are horrified by what they read about her and about Christian science and they run like rabbits. So, we have our work to do. So what would our work be in regard to this? Exactly what you're doing now. And thank this you. is the truth. And I thank God every day that I was able to find Plainfield. I, I don't know. Anyway, this is, the, this is it. Right this here. is it. If you, if you don't accept her as the woman in the apocalypse, Get this book. Read his arguments. They're very compelling. So much was hit, including that in 1943, and I mentioned this last time, in the Sentinel and in the Journal, people gathered together. They got all these facts together. There's an article called Mrs. Eddy's Place, in which they acknowledge that she is the woman in the apocalypse. But here we have teachers that are telling you she isn't. So, That's almost hard to believe. I can hardly believe it. It's hard to believe. I mean, that, that people don't realize that she is. <laughs> well, uh, I tell you, this, this is very, very uh, kind of illuminating. I mean, uh, um, uh, to me, uh, like this is many, many years ago when Helen Wright was writing her books. I mean, I didn't know what to make of her books. I don't really have a view one way or the other, except I sometimes thought, oh, it seems awfully extreme. I just don't know, you know? And um, that really kind of puts in perspective what she wrote. Well, it does. And it also explains why the Carpenter books, which do explain her, explain her work, tell you how to demonstrate the science, what were done to those books. By the BOD. Correct. Yeah, so for those of you who don't know what I mean, it's like, um, you know, there's there's a sense that you I'm not sure about what the Boston church is doing. Is it something that um, you work within the Boston organization or for um, the Boston organization hopeless and um, you shouldn't be a part of it, you know? I mean, there's, there's not an easy answer to that, you know? I think people have struggled with that for a long time. That is absolutely right. Yes. And he goes into a lot of that as well, um, which I find very interesting because he speaks, he, he says clearly what I have felt in my heart. Now, no one can ever tell you what to do in these situations as to whether to be part of the organization or not. That is totally up to you and your God. Um, and he speaks that uh, Mrs. Eddy was asked, well, what will happen when you pass on the Christian science movement? And she said, she passes on. Christian science movement will deteriorate material prosperity. And and in this book, he said, isn't this what happened? Everybody's using it. I mean, Mrs. Evans would talk about this all the time, all these great companies who are Christian scientists, 
Everybody's doing really well. Everyone's using it to make their own lives better. And then, and I, I believe it was Kimball that talked with, and then he said, well, what would happen if you ascend? And she said, that if I ascend, the organization will dissolve. She said the Mother Church will dissolve. dissolve. Now, we, we get into what happened at Gethsemane, where the students, the, the disciples slept. So, Jesus had to go into the crucifixion and the resurrection. Well, in a way, this is what Mrs. Eddy was saying, too. Um, now, I don't know, some people say they felt that they did see her ascend, and maybe those people in her home had this higher understanding of church. But this guy, Smiley, brings out, and I agree with him, if, you, if your body is sick, you don't kill your body. You, you work it out, don't you? You work it out. Um, and, and so it is with church. He said that, and he didn't say it in this way, but in a way there are two extremes. There are those who rah, rah, rah the organization, and then there are those who want to totally get rid of the organization. Now, there is there is a proper sense of having right now we need a gathering point, don't we? We need some structure to learn and to grow. We need the practitioners. We need other things. And as your thought spiritualizes and grows, maybe this sense of organization will eventually fade out. But you don't either take either extreme. Because some people are just so into the organization and there's no spiritualization of thought. So. But what is my healthy attitude that we should have towards a church? I think this also puts a perspective on uh, something that I have never, I don't know, sometimes it makes me angry, but, um, you know, uh, Mary, you were reading some things from letters written by Mary Baker Eddy, you know? They're very illuminating. So, uh, um, you can find this on the uh, the Boston website. Um, there's, there's a write-up of Mary Baker Eddy's letter. And they have... Um, something like 20,000 letters written by her. I mean, I, I'm astounded at this, the volume of letters. But um, can any of us go into a reading room and get a book and read some of those letters? Well, where do we find copies of those letters? You know? Well, again, that's Huge. Okay. I mean, this sounds like it's more than the published writing. There are so many letters. And they're on the website? No, no, an article about them. Oh. An article <laughs> about them talks about the preservation of them. So way back when, a long time ago, they went through some process using wax to preserve them. Um, and then they were talking about um, them kind of having to re-preserve them to uh, do something else to preserve them. So they have, they have all these um, these letters. They've, uh, they've um, actually scanned them all and everything, so they have them electronically. Um, but um, I don't think they're available anywhere. So they're buried. They are. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, now, some of them are in the blue book, but the blue book is not in the reading room. Well, yeah. and they're in, they're in the precepts, and that's why we were sued. We were sued because they didn't want the letters out. I don't know. Ann Beals, last I heard, was having a hard time with the BOD. Um, to me, all of these reasons, to me, it is very clear why I don't have, want to have nothing to do with the organization. It's just very, very clear to me. If it's not clear to other people, well, that's their choice. But it, it, it becomes more and more clear to me. They were going to sue I mean, us over the letters. Another example is um, I, I knew someone a long, long time ago that he collected letters written by Mary Baker Eddy. And um, uh, people uh, found out about it, and uh, the, uh, the Boston church tried vigorously to buy those letters from him. Um, just a yes, right. huge effort to, to, to buy those letters. But 
Yeah. You think about it. That's what they were doing. They would they would uh, buy these letters, gather them up from wherever, and then you never see them or hear of them. Right. Mm -hmm. They don't want you to know these things. I animal know. magnetism. It's not person, place, or thing. It's animal magnetism. Now, Florence, what did you say? Why? What is the importance of seeing Mrs. Eddy as, as the woman in the apocalypse? Well, first of all, for me, I think that reading science and health, if it doesn't do anything for someone to see that <clears throat> certainly it couldn't be an ordinary person writing this, that's one thing. And then, you know, to, to see her really as on the level of Christ Jesus, for me, brings a reverence that makes you want, makes you obey what she has said. It's not something that someone is just saying. It's obvious. I mean, it's obvious to me. This is on holy, on a holy level, and there it has to be recognized. It's nothing ordinary, not on any, you know, human level at all. Thank you. May I add on to that that I had just read, and I don't even know where it was right now in the early workers, said that Mrs. Eddy herself said. She has to go back and study science and health herself to understand what God had her write. Yes. I love that. Yeah. Now, I'm going to read again from the Smiley, Smiley book. <clears throat> when Jesus was crucified, the disciples fled from Calvary and went back to their fishing, not remaining faithful to his command. When Jesus returned from his resurrection, he talked with two of his disciples on the road to Emmaus. From them, he learned that the disciples had given up and they felt all was lost. Apparently, his marvelous words and works were not sufficient to maintain the loyalty of disciples. It was only when he revealed to them his place in Bible prophecy, beginning at Moses and the prophets, that the disciples' eyes were opened and their hearts burned within them. Then they began to demonstrate the truth and to do the work he had entrusted to them. The proper recognition of their master illumined their thinking, made them understand for certain that his teachings were divine. The large majority of Christian scientists do not understand Mrs. Eddy's place in the Bible, prophecy, and therefore Mrs. Eddy's words and works do not carry the authority, importance, and impact to their thinking as they should. Very few scientists have searched the scriptures to find their leader. Without a recognition of Mrs. Eddy's place in Bible prophecy, they will not obediently follow her as discover and founder and leader of the science. Now that's exactly what Florence said. That's the demonstration of one mind. You think of the importance, the road to Emmaus. It was it was explaining his prophecy. Isn't that true? I never thought about any of this. And that's what opened their eyes. So how important it is for us to see her place in prophecy for just the reasons that Florence made and some of the others. Also, um, when Jesus rebuked his disciples, we talked about last week, not disciples, the uh, Pharisees for not seeing the prophecy being fulfilled right in front of them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And those were the eyes that were closed, closed. and the yeah. ears that were closed. So is what, what we are to do about any of this is just in our own hearts and minds to, uh, to understand it and to take that walk to a man. And, and for whose benefit is it to see her correctly? Is it for her benefit? No. It's for each one of us individually. The importance of seeing her correctly that when you do, it opens your eyes to reality. Yeah. It gives you the best life you could ever have. And that's exactly what she says here over and over. To have the right sense of her 
And, and if you don't, it will darken your thought. And if you do, you will find yourself <laughs> and, and your God and everything right and good. And help it's mankind. Help, pardon me? And help mankind. Help mankind. And be a light <laughs> in the world. You had mentioned how Jesus says, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. And I was thinking about that with what you read, because if we if we don't accept that the Christ lifted up Jesus in the study and Isaiah and everyone else, then then we're going down into a black hole instead, you know, and instead of being lifted up, we're going down towards wherever we place from. So where yes. there's no hope. Where there's no hope. Right. And so, no. I well, I wasn't okay. planning for this to come out in this week's lesson or Bible study, but here it is. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Oh, we can't hang up? No, we're not hanging up. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I want to say, you know, this is a Bible study. So let's get granted to Scripture, okay? So uh, we're talking about the book of Isaiah. And um, you just read through the New Testament and say, yeah, uh, quote Isaiah um, throughout, you know? Um, and, uh, you know, you, you were talking about uh, Jesus and what he was, how he talked about himself. You know, Jesus said that he did not come to um, destroy the law and the prophets, but to fulfill. You know, um, and so one way to look at it, I think there's an interesting story I used from memory, but it's an act where uh, the treasurer for the uh, queen of Ethiopia, I think it was. And left Jerusalem and was reading the book of Isaiah, I guess puzzling over it. And Philip the evangelist um, uh, somehow talking to him to go find this person and speak to him about Isaiah and the word of God and, uh, and he baptized Isaiah. And then the treasurer, you know, um, um, left rejoicing, you know, all very. Um, uh, Wonderful working out there, and uh, you know uh, that was from reading the book of Isaiah. So I don't think we want to lose sight of the scripture because um, sometimes I feel there's a sense that uh, Christian Science is somehow a replacement. Oh, she wrote about Genesis and Revelation. I mean, she's uh, she's grounded in scripture. It helps us understand scripture just like Jesus helps us understand scripture. Absolutely. Also in this book, it was a story I hadn't heard before, but as, as a little child, her parents, her father would be discussing the scripture with friends and maybe arguing and she'd be in bed listening to the whole thing and she couldn't sleep because she had to hear the outcome and then she would think about it for hours later. And uh, it said that she she had memorized mo most of Psalms in the in the New Testament. That she just poured over it. She would sit in her rocking chair and just read the Bible. I'll find it. It, it deserves to be read. You read that too? Yes, I did. But she came home from school, and instead of playing, she would read, get in her rocking chair and read the Bible. Get in the rocking chair and read her Bible. Everything that that science now is is from this Bible. And all of this relates. This is why these Bible studies are so important. And I, I don't know. I know I was getting people telling me they wouldn't be here this Saturday. Well, it shows why, because, uh, again, Sarah doesn't want this message to be told. But that's all right. It's still being told, and it will be on the recording. So, so what do we do now? We, we value and treasure her. The woman in the apocalypse, and, and as ye be lifted up, we will draw all men unto unto you, unto us. So I'll have Gary just read the first verse in Isaiah 54. First one. Sing, O barren, thou that hast there, break forth into singing. And cry aloud. 
thou that didst not travail with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. So you can read that whole chapter for yourself, but perhaps that brings back the tremendous chapter, as is the prophecy of Christ Jesus. But it talks about that, that God is the husband uh, and that they will bear fruit. And Mrs. Eddy identified with that chapter, and it was Judge Hannah. And it was, remember the story Mrs. Eddy told Judge Hannah when he was overtired and overworked yes. to what? To rest and work and do work for himself and just absorb and feel God's love for him. Yes. And he did it. Yes, and the beautiful passages we have on age about praying. Well, while he was doing that, he came upon this chapter, chapter 54, which he recognized was steady to be the one, which I found fascinating. All it, uh, Jeremy was saying it, and I feel like it too. It's like a jigsaw puzzle, and we're finding all the pieces and putting it together, and it'll make one glorious picture for a treasure hunt. <laughs> But it's all coming together, and it's week after week it builds upon each, each thing. And no one but God could be doing this. Nobody. I, I have, I mean, this stuff, it just comes to me. I couldn't do this. It's got to be God. Only God. And, and the moderators, all of you who come together and, and find these things, the lesson writers, everyone working together in one harmonious round. And never doubt the huge effect that this is going to have on our nation and on our world. I can't help but because it is the truth and the power of Almighty God. I don't know where we are in the questions, but <laughs> well, we did. We were talking about question three. Shall we answer question four? Luann's still here. Luann. <laughs> yes, I'm here. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, what does the book of Isaiah reveal about God? Well, Fairley was talking about it. What were you saying, Fairley? Well, um, he's revealed as a Lord who when you have sinned, you will pour his fury upon you, and you will have fire around about you. But then there's always the redemption, which, uh, as in Isaiah 41, when the poor and needy seek water, and, you know, be, for I, the Lord, will hold thy right hand. Fear not, thou worm Jacob, and ye men of Israel. I will help thee, says the Lord and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. And he goes on to have this wonderful passage. Yes. When the poor and needy seek water, and there is none in their tongue, faileth for thirst. I, the Lord, will hear them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. So it's the fire, the fire that burns up the dross, that burns up the false beliefs, and it only comes, it's contending with all those that contend with you. It's burning out any error. It, it, it speaks of a mighty God, a mighty good God that we should trust in and love and worship and obey. Just and merciful. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and, what, and what's the principle behind that? There's a sentence in Science and Health that everybody should be burned on everybody's heart <laughs> about truth life and love are uh, a violation to anything on my phone. Exactly. Yeah. And that is the burning. When you're expressing truth, life, and love, expressing God, any form of error can't, can't come near you. It'll be burned to a powder. And says that in Isaiah, he refers to God as the Lord of hosts 62 times. 
and that designates God as omnipotent. The Lord of hosts, the Lord over all, is omnipotent. It's a beautiful, beautiful chapter, and yes, Isaiah existed, and yes, he wrote it. <clears throat> it also, I was reading the benefits of redemption, of being redeemed. Now, you know, this is from a Christian website, I'm sure, but these are the effects of, of Christian science when we come into science. It says eternal life, forgiveness of sins, freedom from cursed laws, adoption into God's family, deliverance from sin's bondage, peace with God, and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. These are the wonderful benefits of Christian science. And yet, my Redeemer liveth. Amen. Amen. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. And we can rejoice and be glad in that. <laughs> So little did you know, Luann, when you took that <laughs> off. Little did any of us know. Little did any of us know. Didn't Only know God. This wonderful. It's wonderful, and and the information and the that we receive here is is uh, very enlightening. And uh, actually, doing this whole Bible study has given me a chance to to really sit down and spiritualize my thought along with, with Isaiah and the progress that he made in the growth and understanding of God kind of followed along with it from chapter 1 on through. And it was, it was nice to finally be getting some kind of spiritual understanding of all these qualities of God. I know that Isaiah presented them like in the in the waters and the trees and the cedar trees and the myrtle and, and all of that. But once you understand the, the spiritual character of those things, then you understand more about God. And, and doing this Bible study really really helps me delve into that understanding. Thank you so much. And that's the great blessing of doing anything for our church, whether it's proofing or this sort of thing or reading or whatever you do, there's tremendous growth in, the, in progress and that's the spiritualization of thought and that's all that matters. It's not in the human doing of it, it's the spiritualizing your thought. So thank you very much. Thank you, Luann. Thank, 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 thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.